ਦੇ ਦਿਲ ਪਰਦੇਸੀ ਨੂੰ ਤੈਨੂੰ ਨਿਤ ਦਾ ਰੋਣਾ ਪੈ ਜਾਊਗਾ ਨਾਲ ਰੰਜੇਠੇ ਜੋਗੀ ਦੇ ਤੈਨੂੰ ਜੋਗਣ ਹੋਣਾ ਪੈ ਜਾਊਗਾ Hello everybody. Welcome to Flywheel. Your number one source for everything Frax DeFi and everything in between. If you want to know what's going on in the world on chain, you've come to the right place. This is DeFi Dave here with Capital K and we are here to help you harness the fly- the power of the flywheel and talk about power of the flywheel and try to capture the the peaks and troughs we had on the one and only Ansem Z, uh, you know, head researcher at TCG Crypto. Uh this was a fun one honestly this you know we got to get into the head of a trader how he thinks what his frameworks are how he views markets how he views risk and everything in between i got to know him a little bit and uh you know we'll get into it this episode uh kit what do you think i think this is our first trader that we had on and i really enjoy seeing this different perspective that is like non builder you know what i non-builder. mean non builder yeah yeah so cuz traders are the first Yeah, they're the first users of crypto. I mean, the first, you know, the first users of anything because they're the ones, you know, that like want to take the risk and see what's going on. And so, if you want to see what's going on in this ep- episode and see everything that's going on in the world of Flywheel DeFi, make sure you subscribe, hit that bell button, keep up, make sure you leave a comment below, let us know what you think. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Give us a like. Go give us a like right there right now. Don't forget it. And please subscribe to our Substack flywheeloutput.com where all the latest alpha is delivered straight to your inbox. Follow us on Twitter at Flywheel DeFi. Join the conversation at Telegram at Flywheel DeFi. You can follow me on Twitter at DeFi Dave twenty two. You can follow me at zero x capital underscore k. And let's get the flywheel spinning. Do you hold ETH but don't know what to do with it? Want to earn those juicy liquid staking derivative yields but don't know where to start? Well, Frax ETH is there for you. Frax ETH is Frax's native LSD solution, allowing you to earn boosted yields in multiple ways on your ETH. If you want to get started, go to app.frax.finance and turn your ETH into Frax ETH today. Thanks everyone for coming back to Flywheel DeFi. I'm your host DeFi Dave here with Capital K, and today we have a very special episode <laughs> with the man, the myth, the legend, Ansem Well, you've probably up? seen him on the timeline. I'm chilling, chilling. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm good, man. Cannot complain. Cannot complain. Yeah. How you feeling after Denver? Bro, I feel like it took me a couple of days to recover. <laughs> um, but I'm I'm good. I'm good now. Uh yeah. yeah, dude. I don't even know. I don't know if I like Denver as a city. I like the other places I've been to, but Yeah. Was Denver's that your first boring. Was that your first time in Denver? Yeah, it was my first time. I think it was my first time out in the mid like that area, honestly. Mm-hmm. I've done Cali, I've done like done the south, but I've never been around there. Yeah, I mean, definitely different out there. Well, um, where has been your favorite place you travel to for, you know, in your crypto journey? Oh, that's hard. Damn, that's tough. I know. Uh, I think I think probably my favorite. It's definitely a toss up between Barcelona and Lisbon. Oof. Um <laughs> Yeah, hard dude. I think I think Barcelona I'm going to have to go with just because that was like the first trip where I met a ton of crypto people. Mm-hmm. Um like it was I was my first time in Europe. Um and it was also mm-hmm. like where I met everybody like really from online. Like I had met like a, some people just like in New York at consensus and stuff. Mm-hmm. That was the first time I just like met a, a ton of people from crypto Twitter. Mm-hmm. Um and the Avax conference was actually like really good. Uh beautiful city, great food. People are very cool. Uh nightlife is fun, so it was a yeah. good combo, good combo stuff. What was it like seeing the internet come to life like that? Dude, it was weird. <laughs> <laughs> it was weird. Like putting like faces and names to names and accounts and everything. It was like so that was like the first time I'd gone anywhere after like getting a ton of followers. Mm-hmm. Um so as I went from like what like 35k to like 100k and then that, that Barcelona trip was like right after that. Um, 
so I was at the conference and it was like a ton of people would just come up to me like, yo, Ansa, like, what's good? Like, <laughs> what's good? <laughs> but like, I didn't, I didn't know, like, I didn't know anybody from, I just knew their Twitter accounts. Like people would tell me their name. I'd be like, no, what's your Twitter? And they'll tell me your Twitter. I'd be like, oh, what's good? Like, what's up? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it was really dope. Um, yeah. like the crypto community is, is very welcoming offline. I'm, they're not like as mean as they are online. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And this is kind of where I want to get started from, you know, backtracking from the Barcelona where you went from like a few thousand followers to a hundred K. Um, like how did you, you know, get your start in crypto actually before that, like you mentioned in like your blog post when you joined TCG, how, you know, you've been terminally online for like the past decade. So, Dude. <laughs> so like, I want to start from there. Like what was like on some, like a decade ago being terminally online playing wow and everything, bro. I was, I was a kid. Like I would, I would come home from school, do my homework I literally would play video games for like hours and hours and hours on end. Um, like I played, I don't know if you guys know Kingdom Hearts. Kingdom Hearts. Mm-hmm. Yes, um, that's actually where my name comes from. <laughs> uh, yeah, Kingdom Hearts 2 is like my favorite game on, on PS2. That's where I got Ansem from. Uh, but yeah, played played that, like played a ton of like online games. Like I did World of Warcraft. I was doing like the PVP, like all the guilds. Like I had a ton of champions or characters or like the maxed mm-hmm. out level, maxed out items, like all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, when I was playing that when I was like younger, I want to say that had to be like 12, 13, mm-hmm. you know, like around that age. Um, so I've literally, like, I've always been online. Like I was a Tumblr kid. Like I was, I was mm-hmm. everywhere online. A Tumblr kid? Yeah, I was a Tumblr really? kid. Really? Oh. I was were you doing like long posts there too, or were you like reposting photos? I wasn't. Do- I wasn't doing the long posts. I was like, I had one of the. Um... It'd be like sad boy on some. <laughs> yeah, no, I didn't. I didn't have anything like that. I had like mine was like aesthetics and stuff like that. I like shoes mm. and everything. But I, I followed all the accounts that did that. Like Tumblr was mm-hmm. was crazy, um, yeah. and that kind of was like the feed directly into Twitter. Like when Tumblr, when when Tumblr like wasn't as big anymore, everybody went to Twitter. Um, yeah, so I was on Twitter, and I guess I got started in crypto probably like 20, 2017. Um, first heard about in 2016, I actually had a course um, at Georgia Tech um, on emerging technologies. Like, that was my minor business. My major was computer science. And we had a course that, like, talked about Bitcoin, just, like, explaining what it was, like, why it was important, like, what crypto was. Um, so that was my intro in, like, 2016. Um, but I've been on Twitter since like 2012. So like I oh, was same. always, yeah, I always <laughs> had my Twitter. I just never posted about crypto on it. Um, but when I yeah. graduated in 2017, um, I was working as a software engineer and I had a mentor that was like really big in crypto. Mm-hmm. And he was like, dude, you got to look at this. Like you got to like start trading this, whatever, whatever. Um, and I already knew what Bitcoin was. So it was like, it's yeah. not really that much. Of Isn't account. like the evolution of your Twitter mm-hmm. account from like when it started to like where it is now and like all the different circles and sub Twitters and communities <laughs> that you're a part of fascinating. Like I felt like, oh, it's in my like hometown's Twitter bubble, then my college Twitter bubble, then, you know, random shit Twitter bubble, then EDM Twitter bubble, now crypto Twitter bubble. Yeah. You know what I mean? Bro, it's so cool. It's like, yeah. I, that's why I was so upset when I lost my account when I got oh, banned because I like, I lost all of my timeline. Like, you know, you, you curate your timeline like yeah. over years. Like it was like a, a decade basically oh, yeah. of information and like messages and like mentions and all my tweets and stuff. Um, so I was like really upset when I lost yeah. my account because as you said, like my Twitter was just my personal Twitter. Like everybody from college was on there, like high school so people were on there. Um, and yeah, and it just fed into crypto when I started posting about crypto, um, when I started trading it, um, but yeah, no, nah, it's awesome. I'm, I'm glad I got it. I got it back. You got it back. I yeah. Got it back. That was me. Thank you, Elon. Yeah. Thank you, Elon. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, bro, your account has been reinstated randomly. And I got yeah. that. I got that email. Yeah. What I find interesting is, you know, you studied computer science in college and you would think like, oh, like he'll probably be a dev, but you ended up becoming a trader. Um, what decided mm-hmm. for you to go on that path instead of being a dev quote unquote um that's a good question i've always liked like the combination um like in 2018 i thought about trying to do crypto like full-time mm-hmm. um i honestly probably should have just went crypto full-time then but i feel like there was a ton of like there was Many a lot such less cases. i know right there was like there was a lot <laughs> less um opportunities i guess mm-hmm. or like i felt that way like crypto was a lot less mature then than it is now um, and I already had like a, a good job as a software engineer. So like, I'm just going to keep doing this, but also just like trade crypto on the side. Um, so it was kind of like, 
learning about trading was was really fun for me. That was like different than what I was doing at work. So crypto mm-hmm. was kind of like that outlet for me. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, so it was, like a, it was a good balance. Yeah. 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 Um, and how long did you think it took for you to get comfortable with crypto, like comfortable with like the culture, the speed, you know, the psyops and everything in between? Bro, <laughs> at least a couple of years, dude. I didn't yeah. know what I didn't know what I was doing in 2017, honestly. Like I just I was like I was buying a ton of stuff, but I had no like larger framework of like how crypto cycles work and like how money flows down like Bitcoin to altcoins and like why all that happens. Like I had the core thesis on why Bitcoin was important. Um but I feel like it was much harder to have a, a core thesis back then on a lot of different altcoins. Yeah. So let's, um, let's touch on that framework. Um, mm-hmm. Like, so what framework do you have now to? Oh. <laughs> yeah. We're getting to the hard question. <laughs> what, framework, <laughs> what framework do you have now on uh, market cycles and crypto as a whole? Um, so the way I think about it is um, you have these like peaks and troughs. Uh, typically in crypto at the highs, you have retail, which is extremely euphoric. Um, you'll see... You'll see it in like, um, like how much leverage is in the system, like just generally in the media, like everybody's like, oh, crypto is the greatest thing since like sliced bread. Um, and people who generally had no idea about what crypto was or like even a strong thesis on like why crypto was important would be like saying it's the greatest thing ever. Uh, and that typically happens like near peaks, near highs. Um, but it, crypto is, as an a- asset class, I feel like is much more susceptible to bubbles than like regular asset classes just because of how small it is, but also because of like how easy it is to have access to it. So like, it's very easy for anybody to go on Uniswap and trade there, like go on any decentralized, whatever, and trade, whatever. Um, I just, a ton of people have a lot of access, I feel like to crypto and it's such a, it's such a small asset class that like, it just, it feeds into that loop. Um, But at the bottom of cycles, you typically will see, um, like crypto assets that have stronger fundamentals do well, which is why Bitcoin usually goes down less than like all these altcoins. Um, you have like people who like have really, really, really strong like theses on why crypto is important. And those are the people who are going to buy regardless of like what the macro outlook is, like mm-hmm. regardless of which exchange is blowing up or like whatever's happening. Cause we've had what well, Mt. Gox, we've had FTX, um, like a ton of different like crypto specific stuff, like the Bitcoin B cash wars. Um, mm-hmm. There's just all of these things that people that like have really strong conviction in crypto. Those don't waver their convictions. Those are people buying um, typically at cycle bottoms, which is typically why you'll see Bitcoin um, do well at the beginning of bull markets. Because mm-hmm. it's like that's what the strongest holders have. So it's easier for it to trend up once it exits out of like its accumulation phase or whatever that is. Um, so typically Bitcoin leads, like you'll see, um, strength in, in certain altcoins, like in 2019, I think it was what, like synthetics, like Aave, Synthetic. Chainlink. um, Chainlink. Yeah. So there's always like some that do really well. And we kind of have seen that in the past bear market. Like we saw GMX do really well. Mm-hmm. And Lido is probably another one that did really well. Um, but generally you're going to see Bitcoin lead for a bit. And then once Bitcoin reprices higher, that's when you're going to see, uh, like, the money flow back into altcoins, which is what I think is about to happen now, actually. Like, I think Bitcoin dominance is actually in a really good position now to go up a bit. And then once like that happens and Bitcoin starts its its pullback, then you'll probably see money going to altcoins. Yeah. What's your take on, well, this is this interview's going to be out in a week and a half, but what's your take on Bology and his Bitcoin thesis of, you know, oh, there's going to be hyperinflation within 90 days? Dude, I, I think he's, I think he's wild. I mean, I think he has, he's wild. I think he has, I don't want that to happen. Like, I don't want yeah. that to happen. Um, I don't think it's going to happen. I mm-hmm. I think what, like, why it makes sense for him is like, he probably has a ton of Bitcoin. Like, he's probably yeah. has oh, yeah. whatever, like a large percentage of his net worth in Bitcoin. So a $2 million bet for him, if you have, what, like 20 million plus or whatever, how much, mo- like millions in Bitcoin he has, if price appreciates a significant percent, that's nothing really for him, like from mm-hmm. like a pure like price price mm-hmm. perspective. Um, but I do think he's really trying to he's he's definitely going over the top, but he's trying to get people aware of like more knowledge about the banking system and how it's structured mm-hmm. and how it works. Because a ton of people really have no idea. Mm-hmm. They put their money in the bank and they just assume they can pull it out whenever. 
they don't know what banks are doing behind the scenes with that money. They don't know like how much cash they actually have on hand. Um, And they also don't know like some of the effects of what the Fed is doing can have on like on currencies. So I think it's it's important in that regard to get people Mm -hmm. thinking that way. I think sensationalizing it. I'm not sure if it's. Yeah, I think he's dead serious because he keeps on. Uh, retweeting everyone's like oh like look i was right about covid look at this thread i wrote in january 30th 2020 and so i think he's dead serious and about this i think think, i think he's quite maybe i'm not sure if 90 days is it um but it's just right now it's just so so hard to think about and so hard to fathom it's kind of the equivalent of like luna before luna collapsed or ftx before ftx collapsed I don't think any of us, or even before the USDC DPEG, I don't think any of us could have imagined it to happen until it happened. That's so true. I don't, so that's why I don't count it out, but it's still very hard to imagine. Um, and if like, you know, let's say he, he's wrong, then like you said, it's, you know, a great education marketing tool about the banking system and Bitcoin. And yes, we do have an exit now, but if he's right, what an awful thing to be right about. Yeah, like terrible, yeah. right? Like, yeah. I good. don't think, I don't think, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, I do think there's like, there's some merit to like the, the anti-inflation being very, hedged is being very important right now. You can see it with gold. So like one, one thing right. I think that people have not really thought deeply about is like if gold goes parabolic in the same way it did in like the 70s when we had higher inflation or even in like the early 2000s, um, it like went on a pretty massive bull run from like 01 to, to, to like 2011. Mm-hmm. But like, if you have, so the scenario is for like the bull case for gold, like if you have entrenched inflation over the next like few years or whatever, say the Fed keeps rates at like whatever they are at, like 4.5%, 5%. Mm-hmm. Um, and they reach a point where they can't put any more stress on the system and have to end up cutting rates or like keeping them where they are and then, and then cutting um, what happens if inflation stays at like three, four percent, which is higher than their two percent target? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And what, how, where are people going to allocate if you have rates higher than normal, which adversely affects these risk assets, and you have inflation higher than normal? Um, so that's like better for stuff like gold. So I do think there's merit in that. Like if you see gold rip like over two thousand and just like keeps going up, Bitcoin is definitely going to trade mm-hmm. right alongside that. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Bitcoin's down what like. 70 percent still from all-time high gold is literally about to break all-time high um and like oh, one of the one of the I didn't best think about charts. that yeah gold's like mm-hmm. not not for it gets yeah. at it's at like 19 i want to say it's 1950 and the all-time high is like 2075 yeah. so yeah. it's like if yeah. you have a ton of these trad like traditional investors being like gold is a great investment we're in a stagflationary regime there's going to be some people who are like okay gold's doing well i'm going to buy digital gold which is bitcoin um, and we've never really seen globally banking get stressed like it is now in Bitcoin's history. So I, I think yeah. there's there's good point. Like I do yeah. think Bitcoin's going to do really well. I don't think it's going to a million, but <laughs> I, yeah. I think it'll do well. Yeah. And another thing to think about is um, I feel like less less countries and less sovereigns like want to hold dollars, and and uh, more yeah. and more countries are making deals with China and the you know digital yuan being rolled out. And so quite simply, if like less people hold U.S. debt, that's more stress on the whole system as a whole. Yeah, that's that's another piece of it, too. So, yeah, yeah, I I definitely agree. Yeah. Kit, what are you thinking right now? What are you pondering? (sighs) Kit's saying two million. (laughs) Two million million in 45 days. I mean, I... I really feel like Balaji is trying to just send a message out there. You know, like you really got to shock the system because his bet was what everybody talked about. Every group chat, everything on the timeline was picking comments on it. Even GCR had mm-hmm. to come in and be like, hey, let me put a cap on this real quick because he needed to send <laughs> yeah. a message and get everybody to yeah. think about this. And regardless, if not, you know, it's, it's two, two million bucks is probably just marketing expense to him. He probably doesn't even think about mm-hmm. it. So I think the cost is low there. And on the gold bit, I was looking at it, and it's been pretty much moving in lockstep with BTC. Kind of yep, on this move up right now. And I'm just like, interesting. Because I think another bit yeah, that we didn't get to touch on is BTC has been decoupling with the, the equities for a hot minute now, for the last couple months. And there is a case to be had where... People would argue, hey, we need to look for uncorrelated assets. 
in this high interest environment. We got to go somewhere where, you know, equity is getting smashed. We got to go somewhere where we're completely decorrelated or uncorrelated. And that's another thesis that can kind of emerge in the coming years. So I feel BTC definitely has legs. Now, like if BTC dominance is at like what, 48, 47.7, I'm looking at right now. And I'm yeah. like, it's, it's, it's getting up there. You know, every single time it wakes yeah. up there, it's like a nice flag to say, all right, guys, welcome in the alt season. It's like winter is coming. <laughs> Except it's, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's a, a top of range, a top of range right now. It's, it's, been, yeah. like, it's been there for like two years, I think. Dude. Um, like the ETH BTC kind of aligns with it too. Ugh. Like that May 21 run where it went to like four, mm-hmm. uh, first time with like 4K or whatever, 4.2 or whatever. That's mm-hmm. like the mm-hmm. top of ETH BTC. It still has never gone yeah, over that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that was like the top. I think like that was the top like retail, the market in last cycle. Um, but no, I definitely yeah. agree. I like, I've been saying for a while, I think Bitcoin is eventually going to decorrelate from tech. And every time it doesn't, and everybody people are like, see, you were wrong again. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I do. I do think it's eventually going to happen. Yeah. yeah. Can, can we talk about ETH BTC really quick? I just look at this graph and it just keeps on pushing. And I'm like, it got to stop. You got to stop. It's getting killed right now, dude. Yeah, I'm, I'm bearish. I mean, I'm bearish ETH BTC in the short term. Um, I think like the LSD and like the merge narrative was really strong. Um, and like those tokens did really well, but it's still, even with that backdrop, it couldn't get over those highs from May. Um, I mm-hmm. think that says a lot about like how, how important those levels are, but I think, mm-hmm. what, do, what do you have coming up? You have Shanghai. You have Shanghai. Yeah. Um, so like, that's April. like, yeah, yeah. I think Lido said they're gonna, they're not gonna let people withdraw until like yeah. May or something because yeah, they want right. to do like extra audits, I think on their system. Yeah. Um, so that's like an overhang, um, but yeah, I just think like the, it's not really that bearish ETH. I just think like the narrative for Bitcoin is just super strong right now. Um, mm-hmm. Like ETH as a smart contract platform is always going to be competing with all of these other L1s and other ecosystems. And also, I think it makes more sense to think about Ethereum as like Ethereum plus rollups um, instead of just like Ethereum. Because you're going to have like if all these other rollups have tokens too, like what are those going to get valued at? And like who are the people buying those? Um, so I think more what makes more sense in my mind is like ETH plus ETH rollups against Bitcoin rather than just like ETH against BTC mm-hmm. because it's like that um, that entire ecosystem. Um, but yeah, I, I think 0.05 is like good. It's like when people when you hear like when you see the beat the Bitcoin maxis celebrating <laughs> and like the ETH guys mm-hmm. very upset. That's probably when you want to swap back in Ethereum. The death to ETH party. Yeah. <laughs> Dude. And that was Pico. Pico <laughs> yeah, bottom, bottom, bro. Yeah. Pico. Pico bottom. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, um, one thing that I've noticed or like that you've been being the drum on for a while is just a bunch of different smart contract chains. Um, you know, you're really bullish Solana. You know, I saw you tweeting the Solana drum still today. Um, you were, you know, writing about Celestia and Cosmos. Uh, what is your, you know, general uh, VM? you know, all L1 thesis. Has it changed at all or is it the same? Um, It's still generally the same. I think that it's like, it's really tough for these L1s to bootstrap a network and then have a community stay over time. I think Solana is one of the networks that's been able to do that. Um, But I think that generally the reason for them existing is because as we know, the EVM and Ethereum at the base layers like doesn't scale well. Um, so you have these other L1s, which use like different VMs, um, like different architectures, um, to like fill essentially that narrative. So you either have, you're going to scale through rollups or your base layer is going to be more scalable. And I think until one of those things, um, is like proven to be like the best method or whatever, you're going to keep having these, these L1s pop up, um, and compete with Ethereum. I do think Ethereum and the rollup ecosystem is very strong just because you can have um, I think you can do all the experimentation at the execution layer on these rollups, mm-hmm. um, whether it's like a general rollup, like Arbitrum, where they have everything running on top. Um, and they also are allowing uh, like devs to program in, in different um, VMs other than the EVM. I think their most recent stylus upgrade is going to allow devs to b- basically build stuff out in um, like Wasm. Um, and, and then you have stuff like optimism, which is uh, like focusing on the modular, more modular side of, of building out rollups. So they want rollups to basically like interchange whatever, like the different pieces, um, whether you mm-hmm. want to use Ethereum for data availability or something else for data availability 
or you want to use like different VMs, the OP stack is thinking through like very modular in the way you design rollups. Um, so I think you have both, but really the the problem that it's solving is like execution at the execution layer. Um, and it, it's not, I don't think it's really, we have a good answer on whether that's going to happen on one base L1 or on rollups. But I think it's clear that the EVM is, is in its, in its design now is not going to be efficient, um, like for crypto long term. So yeah, didn't Arbitrum just announce L3 with Orbit? I didn't really get to read that announcement, but is that similar to um, you know OP's modular stack or no? I haven't I've read that yet. I know what it's usually pretty similar. So like you can have application specific L2s built on top of an L1, or you can have an L2, which is like a general L2, and have application specific L3s built on top of that L2. So yeah, it's similar um, and that yeah. should be the same thinking. At the end of the day, everybody wants to own their own real estate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what it comes down to. Um, but yeah, in your most recent post, uh, you know, you talked about your crypto 2025 thesis. And so one of them is modularity, mobile, and MEV. Uh, I want to talk on mobile a bit because I feel like this is often overlooked by people. And I'm one of those people, to be honest. I usually just interact with crypto on my laptop because I'm like, I don't want to degen on my phone. Too tempting. But can you go over your <laughs> mobile thesis a bit? And what you think, how, how you think that's going to play out? Yeah. So I think, um, in its current form, like the, the people who frequent crypto and like on chain, like applications the most are really us nerds who are deep in crypto 24 seven, have been in crypto for a while, like familiar, familiarize ourselves with everything on chain and like how it works and how, um, everything works together. But I think if you take like the average retail person, um, it's going to be hard to like convert them to doing everything like strictly, strictly on a laptop. I think that the biggest applications are going to be ones that are seamless in the way that you don't really even know you're using like blockchain. Mm -hmm. um, and I think most of that is going to be mobile applications. Um, I like, you can see the trends with like the younger generation, which I think mm -hmm. is the most important to pay attention to when you're looking at trends like far out in the future. Um, and they're all mobile. Like they literally do everything. All mobile. mobile. Yeah. All of them. Mm -hmm. Um, like I'm, I'm such a, a little boomer. brother, like they, all, <laughs> they do everything mobile, dude. Um, so they're always on their phones. So the thinking is like when you have these. So right now, I think crypto is kind of focused on scaling, right? Um, last cycle, we saw like really the key use cases on Ethereum, like DeFi, like NFTs. And now we're like focusing on scaling. And then after that, it's like, what are the consumer applications that are going to fill all this box space that we have now? Because we're not going to be restricted by performance of whatever blockchain that we're using. Has um, anything caught your eye right now in terms of app mobile friendly applications or dApps? Mobile friendly stuff right now. Hmm. Or is it just not evolved yet? Um, I mean, I think Saga is going to be interesting. That's not like technically an application. Mm -hmm. Um, with Saga? I think Saga is like the, the Solana phone. Okay. Um, so like they're coming out with the phone. I think what could be interesting is like Backpack. So Backpack um, is kind of like a wallet. It's like the executable um, NFTs, but it's supposed to be like kind of an operating system. We're going to have different applications built into it. Um, and that's, I think, going to be pretty, pretty sure mobile focused. Um, but yeah, I don't, all the time I don't know that, that many great ones. I feel like there's that's like the space where it's going to evolve a lot, though. Yeah, no, for I mean, sure. And then the last, oh, Kit, were you going to ask something? I was going to say, um, not going to lie, DYDX on the phone is pretty awesome. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> I may or may not know from personal experience <laughs> that it is, it is quite accessible at any moment in time. And it, well, it's because it's small enough no, because it, it is a hot wallet. So you keep a small enough amount in there. But again, mm -hmm. it's also accessible enough that if you need to punt something or you need to react to something while you're out and about, totally possible. Like, I yeah. I mean, I still do. I lug my laptop and my ledger around everywhere with me. And I'm like, there's got to be a better way. I'm like, I, I can't be that dude. <laughs> yeah, nah, do people think I'm I'm insane because I, I did a lot of trading off my phone. Um but it's because like on my computer, I look at charts so much that like I know where all the levels are like in my head. Uh -huh. So I will get if I ever get a notification and I'm not on my laptop, I already uh, know like what I want to like what position I'm looking for, I like see. where to enter, where to I exit. Because like, I look at charts so frequently that it's like I don't need to go back and oh, double check. Is this here? Is this here? 
Uh, the trust yeah, are branded in your brain. Literally, dude. I, <laughs> I, I, I think I can pull up like almost any day from like the past few years. Um, that also reminds me of when the president of El Salvador, somebody tweeted something like, oh, do you, where do you trade? Like on your laptop? And he's like, no, the phone, my phone. <laughs> <laughs> dude. Yeah, buying this, <laughs> yeah, b- yeah, buying the Bitcoin top on his phone. Trading the countries, the country's whole GDP, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so what, what are your thoughts on that kind of nation states buying Bitcoin and buying digital assets? I mean, I, I think it's going to be the same way that like – countries hold gold mm-hmm. i believe the countries are going to do the same thing with bitcoin eventually um it's just bitcoin so small now it's only 400 what 400 billion maybe a little higher since we've mm-hmm. gone up um and gold is like i want to say 10 12 trillion dollar market mm-hmm. um so but yeah so next <laughs> we got dude, <laughs> dude i mean i think like once bitcoin is much bigger and like the multi-trillions there's really no reason that you're not going to see the same thing happen with gold that you're going to see happen with Bitcoin. And El Salvador is a very small like test case. But right now, I think most governments are kind of like anti-crypto. Like the U.S. is full on attacking mm, no. crypto. Like it's I don't understand it personally. Um, I think like they're kind of not seeing the opportunity there and like how much they could benefit from it. Um, but yeah, no, I think you're going to see that like that happen if bitcoin gets as big or like similar size as gold you're gonna see that um and that then the conversation around mining gets a lot more interesting because if you have countries who are like holding bitcoin then they're incentivized to make sure the network is like running properly and then it's like the whole conversation around um like the the fees like the fees argument on bitcoin becomes a lot less important because you have these countries that are going to be willing to pay whatever that is, um, to secure mm-hmm. the network. So I think that eventually happens. Oh, um, think about that. Yeah, I think that eventually happens. I don't think, I don't know about this cycle, maybe the one after after the cycle. Um, mm-hmm. But but yeah, I do think that's a very real, very real possibility. But if, because if not, like if Bitcoin doesn't get that big, then crypto's failed in my opinion. Um, mm-hmm. So. So do you yeah, think I'm, Bitcoin has to lead? I don't think it has to lead i mean i think in its current state it has to now i I like Mm -hmm. i was want to say like it doesn't have to lead in all cycles um i think you can have innovation at like the altcoin layer um and kind of like smaller market step salt smaller market cap stuff pop first but i think right now bitcoin definitely needs to lead just because it's like sending huge signal to people given the macro backdrop given the concerns around the global Mm -hmm. banking system like given the concerns with high inflation if bitcoin if gold were to trade higher and trend really well, like trend hard, and Bitcoin were to not follow, I think that would be really, really bad for just like the space in general. Because it'll be like, why? Mm -hmm. If it's just a risk asset, then why does it really have any fundamental value? Um, So I think Bitcoin needs to prove itself to not trade simply as risk beta to tech or everything else. The Bitcoin narrative has evolved so much. First, it was digital cash. Then it was digital gold. Then it was a hedge against inflation, but it was super volatile, not really. And now, as Balaji says, it's a hedge against hyperinflation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, if that doesn't work, it would yeah. just be a beanie baby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, speaking so, of the it, whole whole banking system and all this, like we have the what FOMC literally in like two days or the next day. Like how are you kind of thinking about that right now, Z, in a backdrop of like the banking system is kind of on the verge, inflation is still not 2%, but yet Jay Powell needs to make a move? I think it's it, they're in a tough spot. I think what they've allowed themselves to do with like their, their program for essentially like backstopping some of the smaller banks, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, they essentially said like, if, if they go down, like we'll step in and help, like and help out um, by like buying their, their bonds at par, yep. the ones that are down mm-hmm. um, because they bought them when interest rates were a lot lower. Um, what I think, I think they're going to do 25. Um, I think they're going to do 25 bips, like stay on course with that. I honestly think if they don't do 25 and they do zero, that would like scare markets because they'll be like, mm-hmm. oh, we think that like there's honestly like a ton of problems and we can't even do 25 like we said we we're going to. Like they mm-hmm. even handed at doing 50 a couple, like a few weeks ago. So I think they're going to do 25, but I think that the language is going to be a lot more dovish compared to all the previous FOMCs, just because of like how they responded to all the market turmoil in the past couple of weeks. Um, even like the, 
I know they they did some some things with like the other global banks um, to like oh uh, they opened up those swap facilities. facilities yeah it's like help with like USD liquidity um, I just think the comments are going to be much more dovish like yes we're still raising like we're still addressing high inflation but we also are focused on making sure like the banking system is like stable um, and addressing all these other problems so I think. That's what they're going to say. The really key thing you're going to have to look for is where they say the dot plots are going to be for the end of the year. I think that's going to be what people are looking at. uh, What's going to be at the end of the year? So like each quarter they do, they release these dot plots, which are essentially Mm -hmm. like where they think the terminal rate um, is going to be at the end of the year. In December, they said it was going to be around five and like 5.25%. That was like most of their estimates. Um, but right now the market is pricing it to be around 4% by end of year. Cause people mm-hmm. think something's going to break in Q2, Q3, like further. And then they're going to have to cut or like, won't be able to raise anymore. Um, so I think like if they revise their dot plots from December lower to match what the market is like looking at, you're going to see risk assets rip really, really hard. If mm-hmm. they don't do that and still like stick to their, um, estimates of like five, whatever, Five one two five, and essentially say no, we're not cutting. Then I think you're going to see risk assets sell off. Um, but on mm. the flip side of that, it's like, what does that mean for all these banks if they're just going to keep continue continuing their hikes? Um, and what does that mean for gold? And what does that mean for Bitcoin? Um, so yeah, it's an interesting. Bitcoin is in a really interesting position because the narrative as store value is probably the strongest that it's ever been. But then also you think through like when the Fed starts cutting and people start buying risk. It's like what are they gonna what are they gonna buy in that scenario? And Bitcoin also trades like a risk asset a lot of times. Um, so that's why I just think that the narrative for Bitcoin is pretty strong. But yeah, it's kind of I'm thinking through FOMC. So, it's, yeah, so it sounds like what, you know, let's break this. Uh, yeah, GCC. <laughs> so, okay, so I want to go into d- detail in this further. Like, what happens if the Fed for the dot plots they go towards what the market thinks towards four percent, and or what happens if the Fed stays its course and says, nah, fuck you. We're going to keep raising rates because we got to do that. And it's at five, more towards 5%. Like, what do you think happens in both those scenarios? Not just the Bitcoin, but just like economy as a whole. Um, I think just as far as like risk and tech, I think if they signal that they're going to lower, like they lower their dot plots, I think those are going to rally. Mm-hmm. Um, and that'll also like take some stress off like banks and these other um, other companies which are affected by high rates, like I think that's going to be better for them. Mm-hmm. Uh, the issue is like if they continue hiking, that just affects a ton of things. Like the the interest we're pay- current paying on our debt is going to be higher for longer. Um, yeah. Like it affects banks. Like it affects all these companies. Um, and they've kind of they these companies have kind of guided this year, thinking that the Fed is going to keep rates higher for longer. So I'm not sure really how how that works, mm-hmm. but. Um, yeah, I'll say, I'll say higher will be negative for most things. Yeah. Um, the issue is like the, the real issue is, is around inflation, like whether they're, that even fixes the problem. Cause if it's a supply side and if inflation is more of a supply side issue and less on the demand side and you kill demand, you're still going to have high inflation. Um, yeah, and yeah. you just killed off the economy and you still have high inflation. Yeah. So that's like the worst case scenario, um, of both things. And the reason people are kind of concerned about that now is because core CPI is still coming in higher, like CPI outside of food and like food and energy is still coming in higher. Like services inflation is the real issue right now. Um, But services gets addressed by like issues in the job market, which is why people think they're going to break that um, to kind of like just break the economy and then break inflation. But like, what are they going to do? They're going to break the economy <laughs> to fix inflation or are they going to allow it to stay up above their 2% target um, and just like, nah, yeah. yeah so. Yeah. It depends where their priorities are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to kind of go back a little bit to like more of your investing and researching philosophy. So you're, I consider you a generalist. Um, and so like, what are the keys on keeping your perspective fresh and being a generalist? Um, and do you think generalist is the right word to describe you? If not, what's another term? Yeah, I think I think generalist is probably right. I try I try and keep an open mind on most things. Um, I think it's really important in crypto to have you like have strong theses, but what are, what's the what do they what do they say? Strong theses, but like weakly held. Um, mm-hmm. So it's like you have to have scenarios where you're wrong, or like where am I wrong in this situation? Like, when does this thesis not work anymore? 
and you have to really stick to those um, because in crypto, everything changes extremely, like extremely fast. And I feel like you need to be able to adapt um, to not only just narratives, but also like technical and technological um, upgrades, like across all the different crypto ecosystems. Um, I would say, yeah, I'd say Genesis is, is the best. I just try to think through um, like not only what's happening now, like what's popular now, but like what's going to make the most sense in the future. Um, and that was like a, a lot of my reasoning for thinking the Cosmos stuff would do well in like early 2022, um, just because the core thesis around like modularity um, and having like your own sovereign chains, I think makes a ton of sense from like a scaling perspective. And then also, I feel like the Cosmos ecosystem just had not gotten um, as much attention as other ecosystems, but they're like very core crypto ethos. Um, so yeah, and you've seen like, these like the modularity pieces get picked up, but like optimism, you kind of have a similar thing to interchain security with what Eigenlayer is doing on top of Ethereum. Um, so I think a lot of their core like theses make a ton of sense. Um, but yeah. Hmm. And uh, another thing in your crypto 2025 post was MEV. Uh, and a few weeks ago, I was re reading about Suave coming out, which is like Flashbots's MEV chain. Um, do you have any thoughts about Suave or just MEV in general and how you think it's going to play out over the next few years? Yeah, I think um, MEV is going to like be a very core part of infrastructure decisions, like infrastructure design and how applications think through their design also. Mm -hmm. um, just because right now, the amount of MEV that we have is going to be a lot, like in the future, it's going to be a lot, a lot bigger market. Um, so if you think through kind of like, all those opportunities that exist on chain. If you have, if you hundred X the amount of users in crypto, that market for MEV is it's that just much like bigger. extremely, <laughs> extremely, it gets huge. Um, and you want that value to be going back to your users. You don't want it to be just like a net negative for every user that's using your system. Um, so I think the, the protocols that optimize for that in the best way are going to do like really well. Are there um, any examples you know of right now? Um, I know like, What's a, what's a good one? There is, what's a good one? I think like Osmosis is probably mm -hmm. a good one. Um, I'm not really sure. I think like, I, so like typically, like when you're an app chain, you have more control like over that and how that, how that works um, in your mm -hmm. systems. Um, whereas like applications are built on these other L1s typically are, affected in like larger ways and have to um, deal with it differently. Um, so I, they're a good one, but off the top of my head, I'm not really sure. Suave is interesting though. I've, I've read yeah. through all their stuff, but how it's going to work in practice, um, yeah. I'm not really sure. I try to read it and I'd probably get like half of it or 75%. <laughs> maybe, maybe not even, no, 75 is too kind. I'd probably get yeah. like 50% would be kind, but I, I just know that you know, it's important, but it's like a whole world in itself, MEV. Like you can definitely have like a whole media platform and site and podcasts dedicated to MEV. And I, I'm pretty sure there is, but I just don't know the name of it off the top of their head. Hundred percent. That would be good. Yeah, hundred percent. You could it's spend just, like you could spend all of your time literally researching yeah, that and MEV. getting like super smart on it. Um, I definitely agree, for sure. Yeah. And another thing I want to go to. Uh, you haven't. Well, well, Kit, you have something. Yeah, yeah. I, I just want to say before we move on, I want to actually go back to the fresh perspective bit. And as, as a generalist, let's, go back. let's, roll, like, it back. let's I, roll back the chain. Let's roll it back. Let's roll back let's the, roll chain. Back the chain. And, <laughs> like, is there a, I guess, a routine or a set of dashboards or charts that you look at to kind of get yourself, like, reoriented every day? Given that, like you said, crypto moves so fast, you got to have strong opinions, but he weekly hell. He just his trading view in his head. Just stares <laughs> at, you know, dreams about it at night. Yeah. He just APIs um, directly into his brain. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I do a ton. I do a ton of, ton of stuff, um, like Twitter and Tweet, like, obviously. Um, it's like, and then there's like a set, like the set of protocols that I'm like watching closely. Um, I have those like their own dedicated like sections, like in, in tweet that I look at. Um, but I look at on chain stuff, I look at leverage stuff, um, I look at like open interest and all that. Um, it's a combination of looking at technicals and looking at user activity and then also looking at like what fundamental upgrades are coming in the future. Um, so I try to keep, try to stay ahead of stuff. Um, Cause like the way crypto works is if you're trying to take a trade in crypto, if you're taking a trade when the news drops, 
you're probably getting sold into, like somebody selling into you. Um, whereas people position way, way, way ahead um, of when these like narratives really start to get publicized um, and like spread. So like being early to to like thinking through that is really key. Um, but it's like people don't usually read all these forums directly from the protocols and like when discussions are happening about are we going to do this or like if we're going to do this like before it's committed to people aren't usually reading those so if you are one of the per like people that's reading through all that stuff early um then you're not reactionary to somebody else's um thesis around something you can build your own um before like the market does for you so it's like there's one way to to trade narratives in crypto which is literally to wait for the market to tell you what's going on um and just purely trade off price which a ton of people do and do really well um like literally you can just purely trade off momentum because they're like in crypto price makes narratives so much stronger <laughs> um like once they're appreciated like once it's it's visible to people um i think that happens with like stocks and other asset classes too but it just happens so quickly in crypto like the ai narrative was one that was just like <laughs> insane. Like, sure, if you were like, oh, chat GPT just drops, I'm gonna buy all the AI coins in crypto, you did great. But like, I don't think people were thinking that off the top, like yeah. off their head. Um, but if you were just like watching charts, you saw all these AI coins, like highest in volume, like ripping through range highs, like before everything else. Um, so if you just have alerts set, for like different coins at different important levels, which is like something that I do. I have pretty much alerts set for most of the coins. And what do you use for alerts? Coin Gecko or something? Just trading view. Um, just trading view. Yeah. Yeah. I like tra I, whatever the the highest. See, version that's of how you know is. I'm not a trader because I don't even. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, your DeFi, your DeFi Dave, dude. <laughs> I, I'm DeFi Dave as a, as a builder, as yeah. a missionary. Uh, I, I try. I try to avoid uh, over trader doing all that stuff. Like over trading i'll put it that way yeah no nah, i feel you but yeah yeah trading view um it's like different levels get hit and you kind of can like find narratives like later that way mm -hmm. um but yeah it's always better to build your own before price starts moving yeah it's like the markets and charts have a fingerprint on what's going to happen before people realize it it's kind of like a prediction market it is a prediction market like yeah. literally yeah and, yeah and I feel like only recently have all the, the crypto folks start incorporating all the macro elements into everything <laughs> that you have just said, right? Like everything you <laughs> yeah, said worked yeah. almost every cycle up until a certain point where, you know, hey, what is this Fed funds rate thing that's going on here? <laughs> and then everybody starts LARPing uh, on the macro side. So th do you have any tips for the listener to kind of up their macro game a little bit to see what kind of dashboards or information they should be looking at? I don't know, man. I feel like I'm I'm a left curve macro guy, honestly. I don't feel like I'm the <laughs> I'm a right curve macro guy. Um well, I say, I mean, honestly, like everything that you need to learn, I've been able to learn like pretty much online. Um, whether that be from like reading people's blog posts or like literally buying stuff off Amazon and reading about the Fed and all that stuff. Um, I think really isn't it's I wouldn't say that you need to be an expert on macro to trade well in crypto. I wouldn't like advise people to be like, you need to know everything about like macro to do well in crypto, but you do need a core thesis on why crypto is important and that general like knowledge of what's going on um, with macro. But you don't need to be an expert on on like everything. Like, you don't need to know everything about reverse repos and all of that. Um, but I think one way to like, like hedge against that, like hedge against not having a strong, like fundamental macro background is to be really good with technicals. Because a ton of people who were bearish macro and still are bearish macro still have not bought any Bitcoin, Ethereum, anything because they think a recession is coming this year or depression is coming. Um, and that's why they're just like not buying. Like, I'm, not, I'm not buying right now. So it's it's dangerous to get sucked into that mindset also because you may be thinking in the present day, but the people who are buying are thinking like six, 12 months out. Because um, like when inflation peaked at like 9.1% in June or July 2022, that was basically the bottom for most, like most risk mm -hmm. asset um, right. classes. Like right now, it's basically the bottom for Bitcoin. We had like a slight deviation below it when FTX blew up. Bottom for Ethereum. Um, but if you were thinking, oh, inflation high, this is bad. Like I'm not buying. You're kind of thinking 
like short short sighted. You have to be able to project out into the future. Um, like there are probably a ton of smart people who are like, I'm buying risk like late last year because I think something's going to break. And when something breaks, the Fed is going to have to stop. But that was not like readily apparent to everybody who's just thinking in the present day. Um, that's why people say technicals like front run fundamentals. Um, and it's kind of true, but it's just because you have these people who are extremely smart and that's when they're buying. Follow smart people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of narratives, I mean, we talked about AI, but another narrative, you know, that popped up on the timeline was the China narrative and the Asia narrative. Mm -hmm. uh, and I heard something over the weekend, something like 80, 90% of volume comes out of Asia. Um, what, so what are your thoughts on, you know, how Asia is positioned uh, going into the next cycle? Do you think it's going to dominate the next cycle? Do you think it's going to dominate narratives? Uh, what are your thoughts? I do think it's a really strong narrative. And I think it has merit to it. Um, if you look back at crypto's history, like China and Hong Kong had like a lot of material influence in the crypto markets. I don't know if you guys remember like Bitmain um, and Jihan. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, like yeah, they, yeah. Dude, they dominated Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining. I want to say they had like yeah. over 70, 80 percent or something. Yeah. Jihan like actually, tr he translated the Bitcoin white paper into Chinese. He was the first one to do that. Yeah, like insane. <laughs> um, so like there's a ton of influence over there. Um, like mm -hmm. they're huge, huge, hugely um, influential with Bitcoin and like other cryptos. Um, even like BitMEX, I'm pretty sure was incorporated in Hong Kong. It was. And yeah. I was like yep. the biggest perps. People like people, I feel like people now don't even care about BitMEX, but BitMEX yeah. was, was like. They the paved the way. The they paved yeah, the yes. way for everyone. I mean, Arthur, Arthur would basically art Bitcoin between the mainland and Hong Kong. And that's how he got his start. Yeah, so I, I think that influence is, is historically very important. Um, like even in 2017, when I, I forgot what it was, I think China banned like ICOs. ICOs. <laughs> yes. In like, it was like the middle of 2017, they banned ICOs and we dropped like 50%. Like I remember that, like that. that week. And it was like yeah. insane because China was such a big player in the market. Um, yeah. And I think like this most recent cycle, it's been more, it, it was more US dominated. like. FTX, well, not FTX, I mean, FTX is technically Hong Kong, but like NFTs, SBF, NFTs. Like SBF and other players. Yeah. Um, I think like the liquidity injection from the Fed, like a ton of people would use crypto as like risk um, beta to like stocks. And that's mm -hmm. why the correlation was so strong, um, like on the way up and also on the way down, because everybody was de-risking crypto first, because crypto was like the riskiest. But everybody was long everything because it was like you have to, you had to be long everything because that was like what the setup was. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I do. I do think that's like that's going to be fundamentally important. I think Hong Kong. I want to say they are like legalizing crypto trading. Yeah, for they're doing all a lot citizens of citizens. Like yeah, clearing the way, really regulatory mm -hmm. in June. Yeah. yeah, so like in June, that's also going to be a, a a thing. What's really interesting to me is like if you have a situation where China and Hong Kong are pro crypto, and the U.S. is still anti crypto. What does that look like for what for everybody else who's watching? And then when does the U.S. eventually realize we need to also be pro crypto? It would be too late. Yeah, I mean China is paving the way with their digital yuan. Honestly, mm -hmm. yeah, they already have that out in beta in different cities, um, and especially with the Belt and Road Initiative and you know countries trading in the yuan, um, they're just getting getting ahead of the curve. I'm not sure if those countries are trading the digital yuan, but if like things you know go the way they are in five years. And I think the thing that matters most is, well, one of the things that matters most is velocity of money. And it's just a lot more, if it's faster settled on the digital yuan than everything else, like it's just going to gain more adoption that way. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, but speaking of other theses, uh, you know, we are the Frax podcast and we are all, are all about stable coins. So I want to talk about your stable coin thesis. Do you have one? Have you thought about it? Have you developed a strong position about stable coins? Like where do you think stable coins fit? And, you know, in everything. Um, yeah, I mean, I think stable coins are going to be integral to crypto. I think that that market is going to be hugely important. They're going to grow a ton like, over the next mm -hmm. few years. I think players like like USDC are going to be very big. It's just like that's stable coins are one of the areas where I'm confused on why the U.S. is not pushing harder to be like pro, like in support of stable coins, because that's a whole entire market that you can have for buying like short term U.S. treasuries. 
Um, (laughs) And they're literally not like thinking through that. Like that's literally a global market, not limited. um, Yeah, it's like like a whole new market to sell debt to. It's it's insane. So it's like, if you have- billions of dollars. No, like like trillions. Like, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, so it's like, if you, because people, when when like, when the regular person is using like USDC or whatever stable coin, they're not thinking, oh, I'm buying like US debt. But if it's like, that's what's backing- um, like the centralized stable coins underneath the hood, that can be a huge driver for the U.S., which is why I'm very confused on why they're not like overtly like in support of that. Um, I think decentralized stable coins are also interesting. Um, I think the design mechanisms of them are obviously still evolving. Um, I don't have a strong opinion on whether they should be solely crypto assets or USDC and other like centralized stable coins and backed in those ways. Um, I do think that it's going to be like the, I want to say the, what's the word I'm thinking of? Like the mechanisms for, for what's going to back all these stable coins. I think they're going to evolve a ton. Um, I know, what was it? I think Av, Ave is coming out with their own. Go. Also, yeah. Yeah. Geo. Mm-hmm. And they're saying essentially they're going to allow not just their like lending and borrowing markets, um, to back them, but they're going to also have these other, um, what's the word, like strategies that people can fit in and they can be either backed by like real world assets, um, or like other Delta neutral things in crypto, but it's backed by like le- legitimate things and kind of mm-hmm. have those as like backing. Um, yeah, well, I guess one, I, yeah. Go yeah. Ahead. I was like one reason why, you know, stable coins haven't really taken off in the U S uh, it's because one, there's a no regulatory framework and, you know, what's stopping that. And I think, uh, especially in the executive branch and especially with major banks, they base the major banks have a monopoly on currency, basically. Like those who have like a Fed master account are the ones that are able to deposit at the Fed. Those are the ones that have like access to, you know, short-term treasuries and all that. And so when you kind of open up the, like one of the biggest uh, tug of wars happening is with stable coins and, you know, developing a re- regulatory framework for them is, should only depository institutions issue stable coins? I think no, that would be awful. Um, but, and so far, um, there has been progress on that front, uh, re- like in terms of bills out in Congress. Uh, there's one bill, this Trust Act, that says you don't have to be a depository institution to issue a stable coin. And if you do get a stable coin license, you'll be able to apply for a FedMaster account. And so, you know, I'm, I'm more hopeful than most. Um, will something get done this cycle? I don't know. I think you need a frame stable. Co- I keep on saying this, but you need to sta- frame stable coins more like PayPal than the rest, than as a part of crypto, because if you frame it more like PayPal, then it gives it more utility per se. And yep. like people's daily lives instead of like, oh, people going to invest in this and, you know, waiting for a number to go up. It's like, oh, mm-hmm. no, like people are like literally just transacting, paying friends back or paying salaries or remittances and this and that. So that's that's my stablecoin thesis or my thoughts on <laughs> a few of my thoughts uh, on stablecoins at the moment i know like there's been a ton of different protocols that are now trying to think through their own stable coins i guess how do you think through like where frax like how frax competes with those um i know frax is like different amos which kind of like yeah a, so a frax value the- like into their their stable coin um i know one of them is the curve amo right yeah the curve amo the curve amo is the big daddy the main one mm-hmm. uh, and like you know that keep that helps keep the the peg. But how Frax is thinking about it is, you know, what is the risk free rate? Like, what is the risk free rate that can back Frax? And mm-hmm. what is the risk free asset? Like before, it was USDC, and currently it's USDC. But as we knew from a few weeks ago, uh, it wasn't so risk free. Yeah. And so now, like, what Sam and the Frax team has been thinking since November of last year was, okay, if we're gonna if we're gonna scale a stablecoin into the trillions. What do we need? And it's like, well, we need the FMA. We need the Fed Master account. And so, uh, in the future, I'd expect there to be, you know, FRX USD backing Frax, um, and then it would be it, that would basically either replace USD, USDC or be side by side by USDC and owning all parts of the stack. And like, if there's a way to get that, you know, those, you know, that yield from Treasuries to the Frax DAO, and then the Frax DAO like issues a stablecoin. Then I could, you know, that's where I envision Frax going in the future. Got you. Yeah. Cool. Otherwise, yeah. Go ahead. No. 
Yeah. So and I was going to say how and, that looks on yeah, chain go. now, though, is Frax, the way Frax fits into all these other stable coins that, that you had mentioned, uh, Z, of like all the other de decentralized mm -hmm. stable coins, is that Frax acts as like this liquidity layer for them. Because bootstrapping a stable coin from day one is extremely difficult. It's even yep. harder than, you know, bootstrapping your, your regular pool two token, because this one actually yeah. has to maintain a peg. <laughs> So, yeah. So, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. So because of that, like Frax has a very clear product market fit there. And you see it with the Frax based pool meta pools, which are pools on curve that you could pair against the Frax based pool LP token. Mm -hmm. So so right yeah. now there's only two of those. There's the three pool, which has been there since the beginning of curve, which is DAI, USDC and USDT. And then I think uh, middle of last year, uh, Frax base pool got incorporated into being one of these base pool that could be paired against everything. And that's Frax and USDC. And we saw yeah. the stable TVL in the meta pool got as high as a hundred million. So that means a hundred nice. million stable coins from like, you know, Al USD and a ton of others paired against the Frax base pool LP token. So that's pretty yeah. sick. Frax is yeah, in the liquid, fair. yeah. Frax is in the liquidity business. That's their product market <laughs> fit. It's yeah. like you know the Fed, you know they're ensuring liquidity in the wider economy. Frax is ensuring liquidity there that there's liquidity on chain. The Fed that's of crypto. The Fed of crypto. Yeah. <laughs> Essentially, that's exactly what Frax yes. wants to be. The Fed, the of, Fed crypto. of crypto. Yeah, that and you know stablecoin protocol. So you know if you like stablecoins, you got Frax. If you like LSDs, <laughs> you got Frax ETH. Yes, sir. If you, if you don't like them all, you got FPI. <laughs> if you're in BTC maxing, Frax BTC coming soon. <laughs> soon TM. Yeah. Soon, soon TM. But um, yeah, next thing I, I want to ask um, after that is let's see what we have here. Oh, so how do you think the class of 2021 uh, compared is different from the class of 2017? Bro, I feel like the, the class of 2021, they're like. I don't know, bro. They're like, they're, I feel like they're more degenerate than the 2017 <laughs> class was. I'm not even going to hold you. I, I think like they're like the class of, so the thing with the class of 21 is they are like almost all on chain. Like they didn't know crypto yes. through uh, buying on exchange through Bitrix. Like we learned, well, not learned about crypto. It was mostly through like Bitrix, Coinbase, like whatever. Bitrix. I was buying, yeah, dude, I was buying like, yeah. Mo, like Monaco and, and stuff like that on, oh, on Bitrix. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. But it's like, Class of 2021, they are like got injected directly on chain, so they're like fully degen. Oh, I feel yes. like in every every regard, every aspect. Mm -hmm. um, so like they they really don't have. I don't I don't think they have the framework of thinking through like crypto cycles, like really all that all that well. But like yeah. they're very on chain, which is kind of interesting because like a lot of the low cap stuff will typically be completely uncorrelated from what the rest of the market is doing, mm -hmm. um, and that's also because like they're small in market cap, but. It's another reason for that is because you have these people who are purely on chain and they don't care about <laughs> like every all the other stuff that's going on, what's happening. Like I, I know people in like 2020, um, like late 2020, like early 2021, they just would never even hold Bitcoin at all. Like they literally did not care about Bitcoin, didn't know what it was. All they knew was ETH, Uniswap, and all the, the shit coins <laughs> launching on, on Uniswap. Like they didn't care about, about Bitcoin. They're like, what can I do with Bitcoin? I can't do anything with Bitcoin. Um, so like that's a really interesting dynamic because you have all the other yeah. previous cycle participants who like, hey, we were like BTC first, I would say. Um, and then another, I think, difference is like you have people from previous cycles. Every new cycle, you only have not like a small percent, but like only a certain percent of those people are going to be able to adapt their mindset to what the newest thing is or like what the newest narrative is for the new cycle. So a lot of people from 2017 either like stayed with trading BDC and ETH, didn't do a lot of stuff on chain, or they like didn't do stuff with NFTs, like didn't really mm -hmm. touch those. Um, so I think it's interesting there is like the growth of being a trader in crypto. You have to be able to grow not only just like um, in like as a trader, but like also in how you trade everything in crypto. Um, and I think the 2017 class, not everybody made that leap. Mm. Um, so that's interesting. It's an interesting yeah. dynamic. Some people have stayed boomers. Yeah, li literally. You still yeah. have boomers. Like you have yeah. boomers who are who still haven't done anything on chain. They don't care. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But it's fine. I mean, you need you need those people too. But 
Yeah. yeah it's do, interesting. You, do you feel like the class of 2021 is more open-minded because 2021 was the year the, op- the multi-chain world really came to fruition? Yeah, I think they definitely are more open-minded because that's all they know. Um, like, I don't think you see that many class of 2021 people who are purely ETH maxis. I, I don't think that even really exists. Like the, the people who are the core ETH maxis were people who saw Ethereum funded by Bitcoiners in like mm-hmm. their, their early days. Ethereum still did well. Then in the bear market, they got flooded again by everybody else. <laughs> Ethereum still came back from that. So you have that core group of people who are like very strong in the Ethereum community, which is obviously very important. Um, but the class 2021, they don't they don't have that like framing. Um, yeah. There's like whatever's moving. That's what I'm trading. Yeah. So it's like doesn't matter if I'm bridging to either bridging the Cosmos or bridging Sonner, bridging whatever. Um, they're like on chain. Yeah. <laughs> No uh, loyalty whatsoever. No loyalty. Not at all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not no loyalty. Um, what, what advice do you have for the class of 2021, you know, coming into the future? It's like, this is their first cycle. They went through it. And now that, you know, they're going to have the bear market play out in a bit. But what's your advice to them? Um, that's a good question. Uh, my advice would be to study previous cycles. Um, study history. Uh, study, yeah, study history and like how this stuff works um i think that the 2021 class was going to be a few of them that do really well i will say that playing on chain as like a smaller portfolio um you can basically like 100 percent degen and do everything on chain but i would say that it makes sense to diversify like your spot once you your portfolio grows which is probably going to happen for a ton of people next cycle um See, I would say those are those are two main things. But yeah, I, I definitely would not. I would be thinking through like what's going to happen if ETH BTC is is red for a while because I don't think <laughs> I don't think they've ever seen that. But just like to have that in their realm of possibilities, consider all all the different possibilities. Um, yeah. And yeah, I would say yeah, diversify and, and look at old old cycles. Yeah. Is what I would say. Do you, do you have an unpopular thesis or un, unpopular opinion going into next cycle? I have an unpopular opinion. Um, dang, I was just, I literally was just thinking about this earlier. I was like, <laughs> do I have any like really contrarian, contrarian bets? I mean, I think Solana comes back. I don't know if that's all that contrarian, but I think Solana is going to come back and do well. Um, I think like the concerns over the downtime market, like the chain downtime, uh, I think those are going to get fixed. Um, and I think the, that public sentiment is going to shift a ton there in the future. Mm-hmm. That's probably one contrarian thing I have. Um, what's another contrarian thing? I don't know. Game, is GameFi contrarian? Is GameFi contrarian now? <laughs> it might be. It might be. Uh, <laughs> I know it's like the like most bit. funded thing, most funded thing in like 21 or like whatever, whatever year that was, yeah. it was like the most funded thing. Um, but yeah, I still think like on-chain gaming is going to be huge. That's going to be a huge thing. Um, I think there's also many games that have an off-chain component and like on-chain assets. I think that's going to be interesting, mm-hmm. um, just because that makes just it makes a ton of sense to me. Like from my background growing up playing mm-hmm. games, and it's just like, are there any it, games that stick out to you? Like any on-chain games? Um, on-chain. Well, we have uh, at TCG. We actually just did um, Curio, which is really cool. Yeah, oh, Curio, 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 yeah. Curio cards. Not Curio cards, OX, OX Curio. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But they're like, they're a fully on chain game, um, strategy based game. Um, and they're looking at building out. They're very early stages. But yeah, really, really excited about that one. That's a really cool one. Mm-hmm. Um, very smart, very smart guys. Um, but, but yeah, and there's like, I feel like there's a ton of other games too who are, who have been in development for like a really long time, mm-hmm. um, like the past couple of years. Um, and I think those are going to do well also, stuff like. Yeah. What's some some good ones? It was a dead like, shot from Doctor Disrespect. <laughs> What'd you say? <laughs> There's also Dead Shot from uh, Doctor Disrespect that was released by Midnight Society. What's that one? Um, it, it's on PC, and you've heard of Doctor Disrespect, right? He was a massive Twitch personality, yeah. massive. Like he actually has the mustache. a mustache. Looks just like Dave, actually. Yeah, um, <laughs> and he, he has he's his basically own like uh, this. game he has, like, studio. Sunglasses, like yeah. This. Oh my god, that's just like that. 
Like that. This, this is Dr. Disrespect. <laughs> he sounds like the man. I don't think I know who that is. <laughs> oh, dude. It's the, basically, I think it's the best Web3 game launch I've seen. It had 29,000 concurrent viewers streamed in. Um, it's Midnight Society, Dead Drop, Dr. Disrespect. Just group those words together and you'll see it. And honestly, the folks in there that were playing the game, they didn't realize it was a Web3 game. And the account abstraction is so great that they didn't know a wallet was created at the moment they register for the game so what chain yeah, is it on i know that doesn't matter but like i'm curious I, I, yeah, I, I, yeah I, I'm I have curious no too. idea that I'm i have no right idea now. dead drop yeah yeah, yeah this so, is cool that's that's a good yeah. one um and also yeah, actually, the, think, yeah it takes like a while for these games to come out because they are in development like whether it's like alluvium yeah. or like you know parallel prime i mean they just had their airdrop of a month ago or something mm-hmm. and so mm-hmm. like you know I'd be curious to see like how they cook up in the future. Yeah, actually, you guys know what's sick. I I read uh, Unity's. So so Unity is the largest game engine for all mobile games practically alive. And yep. in their um, annual report, they said that games or mobile games specifically are actually being shipped sixty two percent faster than they have in the past. Meaning sixty two percent of mm-hmm. them are going to be released in less than a year. Like games are shipping faster and faster. Mobile games, right? A ton of the assets are pretty much there for you. And Unity really takes the development environment, all the dev tools for you to create a game and ship it really, really quickly. And also they have their ad network plugged in too. So everything is in one product suite. You just kind of plug and play it and kind of let your imagination go. Yeah. Kids specialties gaming. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, dude. We're, if we're looking at the kids, it's like gaming, mobile. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to ask um, one more. If we have, uh, if we're done with gaming here, uh, there's yeah. one more question I want to ask uh, before we, you know, uh, finish up here. But you know, Arb is coming out in a few days. Mm. Finally, the the, the long awaited. Oh, Arbitrum man. airdrop. Yes. I just kept on seeing threads and threads and threads on how to airdrop for that. I just at one point I just muted the word airdrop because I just can't <laughs> it anymore. Um, but how do you think the Arbitrum airdrop is going to play out? Um, you know, right now the IOUs are definitely you know, way higher. You know, on CoinGecko they say nine ten dollars. I don't think it's there. I've seen like OTC trades at a dollar. You know, people are trying to buy ARP for a dollar. So. How do you think ARP's going to play out? Do you think there's going to be like massive spot demand and then it just rips? Or do you think, you know, there's too many people that got tokens and it's just going to dump? Uh, so that's tough. I think, so I think that the current setup that we're in, I'm personally like of the opinion um, that we're kind of like in like a new bowl, like starting around like this year towards mm-hmm. like later this year. And I think the Arbitrum airdrop is going to be comparable to like the Uniswap airdrop. Mm. Um, so like Uniswap was a huge, like capital injection for people and like that they weren't expecting. Um, and that kind of like was, was bullish for the market. Um, I think Arbitrum is going to be the same way. Like you're going to have a ton of people who got so much like money from this Arbitrum airdrop. And I think they're going to keep that on chain, um, on Arbitrum. And you're going to see those other Arbitrum ecosystem coins do really well, especially the ones who are like smaller size. Um, I, I do think, think that, yeah, oh, I think like, yeah, I think like the first, like we kind of saw like DeFi, DeFi summer, um, 2020, I think you're going to see like a smaller version of that, um, on Arbitrum. It's kind of already been happening like the past, past couple yeah. months. Yeah. What do you um, think is going to rip on Arbitrum? Like, what do you think? Who's, who do you think is going to be in a good position? Not financial advice. I think? <laughs> not, not with names. Not financial, not financial <laughs> advice. <laughs> um, uh, what were some of the big ones? I mean, I think GMX, obviously. Mm-hmm. I think Magic is, is another good one. Also, is like the GameFi, GameFi narrative. Mm-hmm. Um, I think one interesting one is like Radiant Capital. They're like mm-hmm. kind of like the omni-chain mm-hmm. lending and borrowing protocol. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's, that's another interesting one. I think really the one, and I actually miss, like, I miss this one, but I think Grail was, like, really, really cool mm. um, because, like, one of the key themes when you have a chain with, like, its own identity is, like, what's the native, what are the native applications on that mm. chain? Um, and Grail and Camelot, I think, fits that narrative um, pretty well. It's, like, the native decks. I saw it when it was, like, super low, dude. I, like, I think we all did. Like, yeah. they had their, their, like, oh, partnership, and it's just, like, two guys, like, you know, yeah. doing 
dapping each other up. <laughs> exactly. So like, yeah, that's that's like one I think is going to continue to do well. I'm pretty sure it's not even it's not that small anymore. It's been up a, t- no, up it's a ton. Up. Yeah. yeah, it's up a ton. Um, but yeah, like generally, generally thinking though, you want to look for what the native apps are on Arbitrum. Um, and like which one of those you think are going to do well? Because that's typically where like capital flows to and it's sticky there. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm Where's just that imagining. Thing I think so. I think. Yeah. What do you say? Go ahead. I just I'm just imagining like our listeners uh, are going to CoinGecko categories, Arbitrum oh ecosystem, God. market cap sort yeah. low to high, <laughs> <laughs> and it starts yeah. going. After <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> um, <sighs> but I think I think it trades around a dollar. Well, I want I want to say around a dollar. I think a dollar would be like. FTV of like 10 billion, right? Yeah. There's 10 billion correct. tokens. Um, so Optimism is around 10 billion. Arbitrum has more users, like more activity, more TVL than Optimism currently. So I think that's kind of like a fair pricing for it to start at. I do think you're going to see some profit taking um, in the beginning. Um, but there's just going to be people who are literally doing that side by side comparison with Optimism. I think it's going to be a lot of those people who didn't get the airdrop. Like the, the thing is with these um, these airdrops is they typically go to the most active people on chain, um, and that overlap is not always the people with the most capital. Um, so you're gonna have a ton of people who don't have currently um, exposure to Arbitrum, but have wanted exposure to Arbitrum for a long time, and are gonna be looking to position for the airdrop. Because if you think Arbitrum is gonna be the biggest L2 or like one of the biggest L2s on Ethereum, um, a lot of people are gonna want exposure there. So. Mm. Nice. Well, we'll see when this is released. Uh, Wednesday next week, we'll see how this all plays plays yeah. out. It's played out. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah. Uh, can you have any more questions? Are you ready for our fire round? Wrap. Uh, yeah. Actually, one one last question. Just just before we get there, is is the, if you could look back in your kind of crypto trading career, what were some of your like biggest mistakes? Mm-hmm. You would say. Like, like, what are some like battle tested, <laughs> hard won lessons that you could impart Bro. onto our listeners? Oh, I have Show a ton. Show me the scars. Oh Let's hear it. Let's hear it. <laughs> Show me the scars. <laughs> what, what scars? What scars I have, dude? Yeah. Um, I would say the biggest one is like never, never over leverage. Really, you don't need to. Um, every time, every time, to, you don't need to over leverage unless you like really know what you're doing. Like there are people, like if you're like a day trader, you trade like all the time. Um, they use leverage like in a, in a ton of ways. Um, that's like mm-hmm. really smart. But like, if you're a new trader, don't literally don't, you don't need it. You really, I promise you, you don't need it because crypto trades, um, like crypto goes parabolic in ways that like most other asset classes do not. And I think the returns are going to get less and less cycle by cycle, but still, if you're like active and paying attention, um, and you're on chain and you're like finding these narratives before people, the work that you're doing there, you don't need to, um, like you won't need to make up for that with leverage. If you're doing all the work beforehand, you won't need to make up with that with leverage. That's how I think about it. Um, I would say if you ever are like not fully locked into crypto, make sure that your portfolio allocation reflects that. <laughs> um, so like when I am, me personally, like 2021, I was full, like, fully like all the way in crypto. Like I was looking at charts more like what bio 12 plus hours a day maybe even more than that at times like mm-hmm. first first like every wake every up in the morning like, <laughs> like literally i'm like dreaming like dreaming about charts like oh what am i what am i gonna do <laughs> tomorrow like what like what's my portfolio look like um it was like locked in locked in locked in locked in not really doing a ton of stuff outside like not really doing a ton of stuff with other people um and just like really locked in the markets and that's really beneficial um for like your portfolio returns um Cause like you're spending more time than anybody else, but you need to dial it back when you're not fully locked into markets. Um, like for me personally, I think like my biggest like drop, like in my portfolio was literally not in November 21, not like at the top, but I actually was pretty good about selling like near the top and telling people to sell near the top. Um, but it was in like January of 2022. And I was just like, I've been locked into crypto for so long. Like, I'm going to take a break. Like, I'm not going to take a attention. break. Yeah, I'm going to take a break. I'm not going to pay much attention to stuff. And I like went on a trip and like didn't pull like all my stuff into cash. Like I pulled some into cash, but I didn't pull like everything into cash. And I was like, I'm only going to be gone for like, what, three days, 
Two days. Three days. Dude. Three days. <laughs> was like, That's oh. too long. That's like three no, weeks. Exactly. So you know what I'm talking about. Um, but yeah, I didn't bring like I didn't bring my keys with me. And so like Bro. I was really just like waiting like to get back to my spot. I'm like, oh I don't have that much like exposure. Like it wasn't that bad. But it's like that was my my biggest like drop like at one time. I just was like away and I was like, dude, I'm not I'm not doing this 24 seven. Um but yeah, I didn't like pull everything <laughs> or pull everything out, take everything with me. Um and I thought about it at the time, I was like, do I really want to take all my stuff? Like I'll I probably should. Like, uh, this time I'm not gonna do it. <laughs> and I just did it. Um, so I was like, that's one thing. It's like make sure you always have access to your stuff. If you're not fully locked in, then obviously have your portfolio with like that. Like if you're if your brain is in cash, then your portfolio should be in cash. Um, that's a good like, one. Are, if your brain is in it. cash, your portfolio <laughs> should be in cash. Right like, like, down. If you're not thinking about crypto, then you, you shouldn't be like uh, heavily allocated to crypto. Um, but yeah, that's one thing. No leverage. Make sure you always have like, like thinking through that. Um, what else? Oh, be be cool. Like, be okay with being wrong. Be like, okay be with very, being wrong. Be very like be very okay with being wrong. Being wrong is not a bad thing. People thinking like, if you're, the thing is with crypto Twitter is like. Oh, this guy said this was gonna happen and it didn't happen. And like this person's dumb. It's like, dude, the traders don't win like a large percentage of their trades. You only need a very small percentage of your trades to do really well, to do well in crypto and to do well like just generally if you're good with your mm-hmm. risk. Um, so it's like being strict about what your risk parameters are and like where when you're wrong, being very strict on that is a lot more important than being right like 80%, 90%. 70, even 70% of the time. Um, hmm. So, yeah, I'll say that. And then just, like, journaling all of your stuff is extremely helpful. Like, journaling mm. your portfolio, like, journaling your trades ahead of time, like, after, um, like, whatever your mistakes are. Um, like, I keep second track that. of all that. Like, literally know where you're, not even just, like, the trade that you're taking, but, like, what you're thinking when you're taking the trade and how you think it's going to play out. And then when stuff goes against you, like, what you're thinking and how that feels. Because it also will help you when you're buying bottoms and selling tops. You're like, oh, I'm euphoric right now. That means most people are probably euphoric right now. That means there's probably not that many buyers left. That means I probably should be selling. So. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, I, yeah. I agree. <laughs> I find that whenever I journal my mistakes and I reflect on them, I end up performing a lot better after. Not just with like trading, but with just anything in life. It's yeah. like, oh, where did I fuck up? And how can I fix that fuck up? Yeah. yeah. Here, yeah, here's one very practical bit for, for me, Z, is like the moment I feel like screenshotting and sharing it in the group chats, that's Every when time. you close. Every time. That's when you, that's when you Every close. Every single time. <laughs> you know? Literally, every like, time like, oh, I'm up, I'm up so much. I'm up so much. I got I to gotta show somebody. No, the sh- you sell, then you show. The sh- you yeah, sell, yes, then yeah. you show. <laughs> right, right. So, so I, I, I read this yeah. book on habits. And the habit set is called habit stacking, right? You, you put whatever habit you want to form with a habit that you currently have. So yeah. the moment you take the screenshot, also sell. Okay, advice take there. Take um, yeah. Show and exactly. sell. <laughs> sell for last, show. <laughs> yes, last bit here is, um, you know, you, you mentioned risk a couple of times during this, this pod. And I wanted to hear, like, how do you measure risk? And what practices do you have in place or guardrails, rather, against the risk? Um, so like from a technical perspective, well, let me do, I'll do portfolio. So from portfolio perspective, um, I think that's like how you think about risk first. So that's like Bitcoin and Ethereum typically draw down less than altcoins. Um, and they're typically like less volatile than altcoins. So if you have like a longer term portfolio, you typically want larger percentages in Bitcoin or Ethereum. Um, if you want to have like less exposure to volatility, um, in that way. And it also makes sense because the smaller altcoins, smaller market cap altcoins typically will outperform to the upside. So you don't need as much like exposure there for it to matter like materially, um, in your portfolio. Then like from a technical perspective, I think there's risk in like capping when you're entering positions. So say like, obviously if I want to buy like 20 K where am I wrong? Am I wrong at 15K? Am I wrong at 18K? Am I wrong at 10K? Maybe that is for some people. I mean, I don't think that makes much sense, but yeah. So it's like capping when you're entering position, like where your risk is and like how much of your portfolio um, you're risking on like individual trades. 
um, just like generally thinking through that. And then like other other risks in crypto, there's like what there's like with all this on chain stuff, you always have smart contract risk. Um, so if you're buying things on chain, you got to be thinking through like, OK, is this an audited protocol? If it is an audited protocol, who is it audited by? Um, like how long have they been like yeah. around? Like thinking through even all if that. it is, look at Euler. Look what happened. Exactly. <laughs> and, yeah, and I was going to say like even if it is, even if it is audited, you have to think through like the risk of things on chain being hacked is like a lot higher than Bitcoin going to zero in one day. So it's like you have to think through what your how your portfolio is is divvied up that way. Um, I know what a ton of people do. I saw. I mean, I, I remember seeing the Jen Spartan posts like one time like during the bull and he had i don't know if he posted it was his or somebody else's but they had money spread on so many different protocols um so it was like if one of them went down they still had like money uh, elsewhere um and managing that you have to be like a lot more diligent with managing managing that um but it's like typically if you have these on-chain hacks not everything gets hacked at the same time unless it's like really a, a chain like specific thing um, mm-hmm. So like, like diversifying your risk there, um, thinking through that. And then I was going to say for like stuff that's not audited, you know, like, you know, when you're punting stuff that's extremely early and it's like, you shouldn't be putting a ton of your portfolio in. Punt in responsibly. Like so like punt <laughs> responsibly, if you're going to be like doing like micro caps or whatever, um, make sure you're capping your risk there. Um, yeah. I Also, like, also, I would say one of the big things that people don't really talk about in crypto is like risk that affects your like life in other ways because crypto can suck you in mm. in a way that like takes up so much of your time. So it's like lifestyle, like oh, lifestyle risk. I'm going to call this lifestyle risk. Um, but it's like literally if you aren't good at managing um, like how much time you're spending in crypto and how much time you're spending outside of crypto, whether that be like with your friends or going out or like doing whatever other extracurriculars or whatever stuff that you have outside of crypto, if you completely cut that out and you're full-time crypto, um, that's not like, that's not a good thing. You don't want to let crypto mess up like whatever other stuff you have going on. Cause it's, and it's a lot harder. Like it makes perfect sense like saying this now, but like in peak bull or like whatever, you're not thinking that way. Um, and I think a lot of people don't really have that framing beforehand. Yeah. So, so how do you thing. keep balance in your life then? Me personally, yeah. Um, yeah. I have like, I have set times, like I have set times where I literally will just like not, like not look at crypto stuff, um, mm-hmm. like not be on my computer. Um, and then I'll do like, also like, like just set apart like days, like periods where I literally just won't look at any crypto stuff. Um, just like be completely unplugged. Are you in um, cash then? <laughs> yeah, are you in cash? cash? Like right now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's like, oh no. I don't, I don't think I can. I don't think I can answer that. I don't think I can answer that. Yeah, no comment. I'll, no comment. Yeah. <laughs> just, just know I'm, just know I'm very bull, very bull Bitcoin. Um, yeah. But, okay. But um, yeah. I'll He'll have a taproot r- wizard. So yeah, dude. I might like, need them. I need <laughs> to buy one. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, in terms of keeping a balanced life, like, you know, I like to think of individuals as a pie and like, you know, different parts of that pie make up our identity, you know, like whether it's like where we're from, our family, our interests. Yep. So for me, like how I like to balance it out is like, I have my crypto shit and then I have like, I like going to the gym. I like, you know, yep. going out yep. to shows. I like, you know, memes. Like the, that's what balances me out. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so, yeah. Kit, what balances you out? Um, actually I've been hitting the gym real hard. I, I dropped like eight pounds uh, over the last like two weeks through. Oh, uh, hell yeah. Yeah. So it was nice and been, been lifting. It's been great. Uh, I also play a ton of yeah. uh, Beat Saber. So I actually, <laughs> I bring my, uh, what's that? what's that? The Beat Saber. You guys never played this? You know, it's the one where it's like, you literally are like a Jedi and like you put the shit on and you actually whack like boxes <laughs> that comes at you with like music. And I, I jailbroke it, so I have like BTS and all these like super pumpy K-pop songs, and then I oh, just shit. listen to it, <laughs> bro. I, that sounds I, fire, I, actually. That sounds fire, kid. We need so to I, do like an. We yeah. need to have the flywheel intro just you doing the BTS <laughs> beat saber. <laughs> with, like, Yo, bro, I, with, like, I, I crush, with, like, bro. S S rank. S S rank, bro. S rank. Oh. That would be dope. 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's it. Just, just, I feel it's so right that you need to take time away because I could see myself losing just hours just staring at the screen and looking at the charts, right? It's just, it's Tired. what we do. It's, and it, it's if a that thing. gets tiring, we switch over to the Telegram and the Twitter. It's like we really don't go anywhere for that human interaction, like at all. So, so, so getting except, out there is except okay. the conferences, <laughs> except, the conference. except for conferences, <laughs> which, yeah. which is just Twitter yeah. and Telegram live. <laughs> you know, and everybody yeah. there talks about the charts too. So you still get a piece of that. Right. So yeah, See, yeah. Uh, I have another question. Um, what is your favorite conference memory? Dude, I don't even know if I can say that on on a pod, bro. I don't know. <laughs> oh, <laughs> enough said. Um, I think probably, dude. I don't know. I don't know. If Voltron probably remembers this, but it was the club in in Barca. <laughs> yeah, I love this story. Honestly, like, I'm not, I'm not gonna tell the full story, but the the club in in Barca was Voltron. Um, I think Gammy was with me too. Uh, but yeah, yeah, that was that's my that's my number one in, yeah. in Barca. Dude, Voltron, running back, man. Voltron's still in Brazil. <laughs> He's still there? <laughs> yeah. Dude. Oh, my God. <laughs> I was just talking to him the other day, and I'm just like, damn, he's really living the life. Yo, nah, yeah. he loves it out there, dude. Yeah, he's, yeah. I say he's, I said, yo, you're Voltron maxing. Voltron maxing. No, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and so, yeah, but, you know, soon enough, we'll all be reunited at the next conference or next whatever is ahead of us <laughs> for sure <laughs> fun activities <laughs> for sure. anyways um, yeah let's wrap this one up but we have our rapid fire questions uh, we usually just like you know quick questions to get to know you more uh kit i'll let you go ahead yeah all right so the first question z is when did you first touch the chain what was your virgin crypto experience and sex don't count and sex don't count. <laughs> um, when did I first touch the chain? I want to say it wasn't. It wasn't crypto. No, nope, they have crypto kitties. I want to say 2020, 2020 Ethereum, like late, late DeFi summer. I want to say I was fine first time. I think. Wow. I think. Okay. I I would have yeah. expected you to hop so. on chain soon. Late bloomer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Late bloomer here. <laughs> yeah. Late bloomer, not a boomer though. So good thing. All right. Second <laughs> question. Yeah, very. Second question. What is your favorite off chain touch grass activity? Uh, other than drinking? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, basketball. I hoop all the time. Um nice. I've been in the gym more. Um, but yeah, I play basketball a good bit. Um, I like cooking. Cooking is 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 um. What are you cooking? for me. Do I make everything? I literally cook everything. What was I the last thing about, you cooked? The last thing I cooked, I just made some. I think I made some what basa, which is like fish. I made some basa, uh, some mm-hmm. asparagus and rice. I think that's what I made. Yeah. Last. And how did you dude, learn how to cook? Bro, I, okay, I learned how to cook in college, dude. When I like, you know, when they, they take you off the meal plan, mm-hmm. oh. <laughs> so I, so I literally was like on the meal plan, going to the cafeteria every day. Um, and I moved off campus and I was like, dang, how am I going like, to eat? Like, <laughs> how am I going to eat? I, so I, learned, so I, learned, I had to learn how to cook. That's when I learned how to cook for real, for real. Like when I lived um, off campus, it was probably like, well, like mid college. Um, but yeah, I learned. What was your go to college meal? Dude, tr- drumsticks. Drumsticks? Chicken drumsticks. Mm-hmm. I used to make the entire pack um, and literally just like pack them for like the week and like eat them all week. <laughs> and then <laughs> what else did I make? Ton of ramen. Ton of ramen. Um, ton of ramen. What else did I make? Oh, potatoes. Bro, I used to make potatoes with everything. Everything. With everything. Hey, everything. Everything I cooked, I ate potatoes, ate potatoes with. Dude, I felt like in college that one thing I just always cooked and just kept on eating was ground turkey rice and like just douse it in like teriyaki sauce and have some like frozen vegetables with it and sometimes i'll just get an avocado too to be extra healthy but that was like my go-to meal in college yeah dude, what i used to make like i used to make this rice it, just, it wasn't technically i don't know if you guys know jollof rice which is like the nigerian mm-hmm. like fried rice um i made like a version of that but i just would put hella stuff in it like shrimp like chicken like sausage <laughs> like literally everything yeah, yeah, yeah. and just would put it all <laughs> in rice and i would just eat it for like the entire like the entire week um so i made that a lot i made yeah. that a lot 
<laughs> well, yeah. we'll have a cooking show uh, next time you're here. <laughs> got to. Yeah, but yeah, we got we to. Uh, next question. Uh, what's some advice you would give to your younger self, like your younger college self? Younger college self. Um, honestly, I would say do more in crypto early. Like I would do not just on the trading side, but also like on the developer side, I would do more in crypto early. I think mm-hmm. like at the same mm-hmm. time that I was in, I did like a ton of web dev um, and like mobile dev stuff, like like you know like the clubs in college but i didn't really do any like crypto specific clubs or anything like that um so i would say definitely i would do that i would be my advice for sure which is cool i mean like at, at tech they have that now like they have a crypto club oh, nice. have one yeah now they do yeah kid um final one and final one here i mean if you weren't in crypto and you weren't in software, what would your professional career path be? <laughs> if I wasn't in crypto and I wasn't in software. You'd obviously be a chef. At the- <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a chef, yeah. Um, dang, dude, I've never even thought about that. It was always tech or finance stuff. I mean, I thought about like running track. I was like really good at track and um, when I was younger in high school. So... I don't know. Maybe that I like went to college on academic scholarships. I didn't try and do anything like sports wow. related, but I feel like it would be um, probably something sports related. Wait, what, what was your scholarship in? Uh, I don't know. It was just like a merit scholarship. It oh, covered like okay. most, most of my stuff. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, man. Track, yeah. I guess. Oh, track. <laughs> Great. Sweet. Well, awesome. Thanks for coming on. It's been a fun hour and a half. It's gonna be fun seeing what comes to fruition uh, when this comes out. <laughs> yeah, dude, what's uh, Arbitrum going to? Yeah, what? <laughs> who knows? Ar- Arbitrum to? I, I won't say anything. Two. 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 Thanks for coming on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for joining us for this episode of Flywheel. I'm your host, DeFi Dave, here with Capital K. Make sure you follow us on Twitter at Flywheel DeFi. Join the Telegram conversation at Flywheel DeFi. If you want to catch up with everything Flywheel and in between, make sure you subscribe, hit that bell button. Let us know what you think in the comments. Give us that like button before you go. And follow me on Twitter at DeFi Dave 22. And follow me at 0x capital underscore K. And go to the post game down below. Go, 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 go. Go. Everything said on this episode is not financial or tax advice. This channel is strictly for educational purposes and is not in investment advice or solicitation to buy or sell any assets or to make any financial decisions. This video is not tax advice whatsoever. Please talk to your accountant and do your own research.